Buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos. Para una mejor experiencia, les solicitamos por favor que mantengan sus micrófonos en mute. Todo el material que presentaremos puede ser utilizado para difusión y promoción. Muchas gracias y que disfruten del evento. Han pasado casi seis años desde que denuncié mi abuso. Ganar medallas de oro no quita el dolor de lo que ocurrió. Voy a embarcarme en este viaje de sanación. Renuncié a mi voz durante mucho tiempo. Estaba tan conmocionada. Para mí la cura era una lucha. Solo quiero asegurarme de darles todo lo que necesitan. Muy buenos días. Lifetime les da la más cordial bienvenida y alza la voz en nombre de todas las mujeres para eliminar el abuso y la violencia en todas sus formas en contra de la mujer. Hoy tenemos el orgullo de presentar a ustedes el especial Ali Reisman de la oscuridad a la luz. Y tenemos la fortuna y el orgullo de contar con Ali Reisman, a quien voy a presentar en breves segundos. Es muy importante que sepan que es un tema muy sensible y muy importante. Hay que discutirlo y hay que ponerlo al frente. Entonces, estamos pidiendo que nunca usen la palabra víctima, siempre la palabra sobreviviente. Y siempre vamos a referirnos al abusador o al agresor que haya cometido el acto de violencia o de agresión de cualquier tipo. Es muy importante que tengamos la sensibilidad y el respeto adecuado para escuchar y entender toda esta situación que hoy compartimos en exclusiva con ustedes a través de este especial que se va a estrenar muy pronto en Lifetime. El estreno está pautado para el 25 de noviembre. Es importante que recuerden que todo el material de hoy pueden usarlo para promoción y difusión, y esa es nuestra intención, promover y alzar la voz para eliminar la violencia en contra de la mujer. Ahora les presentamos un video que resume quién es Ali Reisman. Ali Reisman, capitana del equipo ganador de la medalla de oro del equipo de gimnasia de los Estados Unidos en 2012 y 2016 en los Juegos Olímpicos, es la tercera gimnasta americana más condecorada de la historia. Ella se ganó el corazón de millones de personas al ser la primera de ese país y en ese deporte en ganar la medalla de oro en piso en unas Olimpiadas. Además, es una de las tres gimnastas que logró ir a dos Juegos Olímpicos seguidos, guiando al equipo a ganar medallas de oro y plata en las competencias de 2012 y 2016. Como la gran líder que es, Ali usa su plataforma para ayudar a normalizar la conversación sobre salud mental, alentar a mejorar la autoestima y promover la importancia del autocuidado. En su autobiografía, Fierce, comparte lo bueno y lo malo de su carrera, incluyendo cómo sobrevivió a los abusos sexuales e inspirada por un ejército de sobrevivientes. Ali continúa luchando por cambios dentro del deporte y por la erradicación del abuso sexual. Eh, hoy tengo el orgullo de presentar a la múltiple campeona olímpica de los Estados Unidos, Ali Reisman, que hoy tiene un especial, Ali Reisman de la oscuridad a la luz, en donde ella, como activista, ayuda a muchas personas a entender lo que les ha ocurrido y a sanar en ese proceso, a través de este programa que promete romper todas las barreras. Con ustedes, Ali Reisman. Ali. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? How are you, Ali? We would like to know what does the, this special Ali Reisman, Darkness to Life, means to you? It means a lot to me. It's very personal, and I feel very grateful for the opportunity to do this very special project with Lifetime. We worked very, very hard on it. Um, and I feel very appreciative for the survivors and the experts that we had that bravely shared their stories with us and took the time to talk about what they were going through and what they've learned over the years. So I hope that it helps 
um, somebody out there because I know a lot of people out there are struggling, whether that's being a survivor of sexual abuse or struggling with their own um, mental health journey or they're battling something. So hopefully no matter what you've been through, you can take something from this special and it helps you feel less alone and it helps give you hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Thing that you want to get across within this special? I think that what's really important is that we all remember that we're all human. We all go through ups and downs. Life can be like a roller coaster sometimes, and that's all part of it. And I hope that people remember that no matter what you're going through, you're going to be okay. And if you're struggling right now in this moment, you're not going to feel like this forever. There is help out there. And I hope it's a reminder of the importance of having a community and a support system around you. And I recognize that having that finding a community can be very difficult. It's not always easy. And sometimes when we confide in somebody and share what we're feeling, we don't get that validation that I think that so many survivors of abuse really, it's important for their healing. So recognizing if it takes you some time to find a support system, that's okay. If you go to somebody and tell them that something happened to you and they don't support you in the way that you deserve to be supported, I encourage you to not give up and to keep going until you find someone who will support you because I believe there are good people out there. And I believe that everyone should have support and a good community around them because it's so important. You know, the way a survivor heals is linked to how their abuse is handled. So having a support system and having someone validate you and say, I believe you and I see you is just everything. Como saben, nosotros tenemos traducción simultánea en portugués y en español. Así que sigo con la siguiente pregunta. What do you learn from this special? And most importantly, what do you learn from the survivors? I learned that we are all going through so many things and going through hard times and not having the answers is okay and that nobody should go through this journey alone. Um, and I think that when we talk about how we're feeling, it helps us feel less alone because maybe another survivor could relate to what I'm experiencing or maybe a survivor validated what I said. And I think that talking about what we're feeling is really important because it can help us understand why we feel a certain way and help put us on the path towards feeling better. What does your personally, personal healing journey look like? Has it changed? Has it evolved? Can you share that thing with us? Yeah, I think that, you know, over the years, I have really tried to prioritize my own healing. I think, um, you know, there's so many different ups and downs in life. And there are certain moments where, you know, doing therapy once a week is good for me. There are certain times where I feel like I need to do therapy twice a week. And even that doesn't feel like it's enough. And there are certain days where I wake up and I feel more calm. Other days, I feel like it's hard to fall asleep because I'm more stressed out. And I think, I've learned the importance of taking it day by day and really reflecting on how I'm feeling. And when I beat myself up and I am hard on myself, talking about this and um, thinking about other things and having moments of joy and fun, and then also balancing it with doing this work because it is very important to me and I, I want to do it, but it's also, it's challenging as well too. We can only imagine. So what inspired you or make you share your story with others and advocate for others. You know, when I first decided to publicly share my story um, years ago in around 2017, I was really, really nervous and I didn't know how people were going to respond, but I knew that I wanted to say something because I was watching, you know, organizations continue to sweep this under the rug and I was very, um, inspired by other people sharing their stories as well. I think that the power of sharing stories is so incredible how when one person shares their story, it could help someone else feel less alone or give someone else the courage to share their story and speak their truth. And I think that we really saw that during the, when the Me Too movement was, was really, really um, 
in the media and on Twitter and on social media. And so many people were supporting survivors and sharing stories like we've never seen before. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. It's heartbreaking to see how many people have said the words Me Too and um, continue to have the courage to say the words Me Too. It's, it's devastating how much this affects so many people. For me, it's about partnering and listening to the experts in the field so that I can better educate myself and hopefully better, um, if people are interested, um, help people know where to go. Because I think a lot of people want to help, but they don't know where do I start? What do I do? What organizations do I even look at? Uh, we also worked a lot with Rain and they Darkness, Light and Rain have been wonderful to work with and super grateful for their help and, and putting the show together. You have mentioned that you have worked with the leaders of to prevent child abuse, that are the darkness to light. So is there anything that the adults can do to see the signs and prevent child abuse? Is there anything you can share mm -hmm. with us to be more aware of it? Yeah, yeah, that's a very important question and thank you for asking that. So. Um, Darkness to Light and I actually provide um, the training for free. If anyone is interested in taking Darkness to Light, has training um, available for people that is free, and I've taken that. Um, I've taken it twice, and I think that it's really important because it can help us understand what are some of the red flags to look at, what grooming behavior looks like or can look like. Um, and when I had actually watched the training um, a couple of years ago for the first time, I had thought, I wish I saw this when I was a teenager because I would have been able to recognize that something that was happening to me was wrong, or at least I would have had the confidence, hopefully, to ask questions. Sorry, that's my puppy Milo, <laughs> because I think yeah. that asking questions is so important and encouraging kids, even if you're unsure asking questions can help keep you safe and there's no question that's a wrong question and i think that it's important for adults to understand that the way a survivor heals is linked to how their abuse is handled so if a child or an adult discloses to you that they've been abused i think it's really important to tell them that you believe them that you support them ask them how you can help them but then also report the abuse and make sure that the abuser is no longer hurting somebody else and do what you can to help keep them safe because we have to recognize that talking about what we've been through is so hard and being that support system for somebody else and helping them report the abuse and helping stop the abuser is crucial because oftentimes abusers get away with their abuse because a lot of people in our society, whether or not they realize it, are enabling abusers. And because of that, abusers often have more than one victim. You know, we've seen a lot of stories in the news about abusers that have hundreds and, and thousands of victims. Um, you know, in my experience with my abuse, there was hundreds and hundreds of victims and survivors. And that was because for decades, um, the person who abused us was enabled and people didn't listened to us even though there was many times where our abuser was reported to law enforcement. And so I think it's really important for people to understand that um, that there are a lot of red flags that we need to be aware of. You know, some of them might be if, if an abuser has favorites, if there's a person that is trying to get alone time with the child, if the person is trying to give a child gifts, you know, any type of grooming behavior is really important. And, and really, um, you know, I encourage people to also check out the Monique Burr Foundation because they educate children and Darkness to Light educates the adults. And so I think having both things together is so important of the adults being educated, but also the children and recognizing, you know, if you're also a parent who or, or a guardian or you're just um, you're a teacher, whatever you do, we all I think most of us are around children at some point in our lives. So if a child does disclose to you or someone discloses to you that they've been abused um, and you're doing everything you can to help them, also be kind to yourself because if you're one of those adults who is trying to do the right thing and you feel bad that you didn't see it, be kind to yourself. We're all doing the best that we can and sometimes these abusers are master manipulators. And so if you're a person out there that's a good person and I'm sure Every person watching this has beautiful intentions. Don't be so hard on yourself um, and know that 
you're not perfect, you know, and sometimes because there's such a lack of education in our society, the child might not even know they're being abused. Like they didn't see the abuse and they feel guilty and they blame themselves, but just know that you're doing the best that you can. And now that you do know, now you can handle it and now you can report it. Now you can make sure that this person never hurts somebody else again. But if you didn't see it, be kind to yourself. You're not perfect um, and you're doing the best that you can. And now that you do know, you should um, feel proud of yourself that you're doing everything you can to help the child or the adult. So hopefully that all makes sense. I know that was a lot. Very important information. Thank you for sharing. Now, Ali, you once said our society has a long story of enabling abusers instead of supporting survivors. Is that still true? Or do you feel that something has changed? You know, I think that when we look at, you know, when I've talked to so many survivors, um, you know, across the country and even some across the world, I really think a common theme that I often hear is that they were not supported when they when they spoke up. Um, and I speak a lot at colleges across the U.S. and a lot of survivors will tell me that after something happened to them when they, you know, report it to the school or they tell someone they think is a trustworthy person, that person doesn't don't feel that they have a community of support. And so having that and recognizing that, I think it's, it's really important. And I feel very lucky I have a support system and I don't take that lightly because I recognize a lot of survivors don't have that easy access to a good support system or finding a good therapist, somebody that will help them. And so I think until all of those things change, it's going to be a long time until our society isn't enabling abusers. Do you have any advice for any girl or any woman or boy that is dealing mm -hmm. with trauma or with abuse? Yeah, I think that one of the most important things that we also have to recognize as a society is that it is not just women or girls who are survivors of abuse. It's boys, mm -hmm. men, and however one chooses to identify, it can unfortunately happen to anyone. And I think that our society um, doesn't recognize how common this issue is. And so my what i would say to anybody out there who's struggling um, with coming to terms of what happened to them is to be kind to yourself and know that it's not your fault and to know that if you're struggling right now it's okay it's okay to not be okay it's okay to ask for help uh, you're not going to feel like this forever and there truly is good people help out there and I encourage you to find somebody and you're living and you're feeling really anxious and your your trauma is really affecting you that day you're struggling with PTSD give yourself permission to just relax if it helps you and you want to write a journal, if you need to go for a walk outside if you need to just lay down and take a nap just be kind to yourself and give yourself what you need and know that unfortunately we're not going to feel better overnight overnight and that's okay and that's it's frustrating because we don't want to feel like this for a long time but just give yourself what you need and give yourself permission to just relax if you want to like lay on the couch and watch some fun tv do that if that's what you need to take your mind off of what's happening to you just give yourself permission to just do what feels good for you and don't forget to treat yourself like you would treat a loved one or someone you care about and finally, my qu last question will be, what do you partner with Lifetime and how was your experience with Lifetime? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful to Lifetime. It was, um, you know, I've been very impressed over the last um, bunch of years watching Lifetime um, continue to put out um, shows and movies that are supporting survivors and that's something that's really important to me I'm very passionate about that so it felt like a very authentic um, partnership and relationship to explore with Lifetime and so when I found out that they were um, they wanted to do this with me it was very exciting and obviously very honored um, 
and it's been wonderful. I um, worked very closely um, with the president of Lifetime as well on this project, and so I felt very honored and it meant a lot to me that they took this very seriously and it meant a lot to them and um, Lifetime has been very supportive of my journey and continues to support survivors of abuse and I think that whenever I'm choosing a partner in anything in life it's really important that our values align and that we care about the same things and are passionate about the same things so it felt like a really good fit and um, I'm very grateful to Lifetime and, and hopefully in the future we can do more um, content together and more shows together. We are very grateful. Thank you so much. Before we go to the Q&A, I want to remind everybody that we are going to be able to watch the premiere of this special, Ali Reisman from Darkness to Light, um, on November 25th. Eh, vamos a poder ver el estreno del documental de la oscuridad a la luz con Ali Reisman el día 25 de noviembre en México a las 10 de la noche, en Colombia a las 9 y en Argentina a las 11 y también en Brasil. Así que por favor no dejen de verlo. Como ven, eh, eh, Ali no solamente siente, sino que sabe perfectamente lo que está hablando y quiere hacer una gran diferencia junto con Lifetime. Necesitamos de todo el apoyo de ustedes. Ahora, Mariana, vamos para las preguntas y respuestas, por favor. Yes, Cesar, we're going to start with Hernán Sartori from Clarín News. Mariana, are you ready? Argentina. Hello, Hernan. good afternoon. How are you, everyone? It's a pleasure to talk to you, Ali. Uh, is everyone listening to me? Yes? Yes, yes, yes I can hear you. Okay. Um, not only you, but every survivor of sexual abuse suffer what no one must suffer. And that is terrible for itself, but many trust it in doctors or relatives who are the abusers. And then you look for justice and you found some institutions who are supposed to take care of you. They look mm -hmm. to the other side or cover the abuse. Have you felt betrayed by the US Olympic movement, by the criminal justice of a country, by the FBI? How can you tolerate not to be listened when many survivors like you talk about what you suffer and they look to the other side? Yeah, it's uh, something that I still try to navigate and work through every single day. You know, I, I feel like I try to talk a lot about the way a survivor heals can be linked to how their abuse is handled. So to continue to have the United States Olympic Committee and USA Gymnastics not address the many survivors of abuse um, that have suffered because they didn't do the right thing and continue to not do the right thing, not acknowledge the problem and not do everything they can to fix it and understand what happened. Um, you know, for me, one of the most important things is getting the United States Olympic Committee and USA Gymnastics to do a completely full and independent investigation so we can understand who knew what, when, how this disaster happened, and we can make sure it never happens again. Otherwise, it's guesswork, and I don't want to live in a world where we're doing guesswork when we're talking about protecting children and athletes from abuse. But it's very hard, and it, it's, very, it's very triggering, and it sometimes feels like an open wound that doesn't heal because we are continually speaking out about it, trying to advocate for them to do the right thing and, and pushing for them to do the right thing. And it's very hard because part of me, you know, not part of me, I think all of me wishes that I could just not think about this and um, not think about the USA Gymnastics abuse and do other projects that focus on other things. You know, I think I'll always be very passionate about abuse prevention and mental health, but I think that, you know, like testifying in September is so triggering and something that we shouldn't have to do, but years and years later, we're still having to speak out about it. So it feels, um, it's very triggering and it feels like an open wound that won't heal. And it's really affecting my own healing journey because I feel like one moment I feel like I take a step forward and then, you know, taking 
a hundred steps back. And so it's this, it's, it's very hard to navigate and something I still am working on how to do that. But I think, you know, having therapists and having, um, making sure I'm taking care of myself is a priority because it definitely affects me a lot more, I think, than people realize. Thank you, Ali. Next question, Mariana. Yes, from Brazil, Luciano Guaraldo, UOL. Hi, Ali. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. I'm a, I'm a survivor myself, and I know how hard it is to speak up. And when people doubt you, uh, I mean, you, you feel like giving up. I was wondering, you talked, about, about, uh, you talked a lot about support system and forming a community of support. I was wondering, how do you find the balance between supporting others? And I know that you do that a lot, and I admire that a lot in you without uh, getting triggered by the stories, because that's something I struggle with, hearing other people's stories and trying to help them when it opens so many wounds in myself. So I was wondering, how do you find that balance, helping others without yeah. hurting you too much? Yeah, well, thank you for sharing and I support you and I believe you. Thank you for having the bravery to share that with everyone. Um, I totally relate and agree with what you just said in your question. Um, it is something I try to navigate on a daily basis. I get um, triggered very easily. I get triggered with graphic detail. And so for me, because my experience has been so public and I feel so lucky to have so much support, sometimes if I'm walking my dog outside or I'm at the grocery store or I'm at the airport, um, somebody will tell me they're a survivor of abuse. And so I've worked on in therapy of, of working on a way that I can support them. But if the survivor starts going into graphic detail, I've learned to, there's a way I can support them by saying, you know, I support you and I believe you. Um, but sometimes I will say, if, if you don't mind, just not going into graphic detail because that really triggers me. I've never had a survivor that didn't understand that. And they, I feel like whenever I meet survivors, there's this really special bond. It's almost like we have this trust or this understanding without even needing to say anything. And so I've learned when I am supportive and kind and honest, um, I've never had a survivor that gets upset about me asking not to go into graphic detail. And oftentimes they say, I totally understand. I actually feel the same way. And so I, I just try to be honest about what's where I am in my healing. And I think sometimes because I'm in the spotlight, people forget that I am still dealing with this on a daily basis. Um, and so I think I just try to be very honest and transparent and hopefully people will understand, you know, um, you know, even before example, before I came on to do this interview, there was um, a video that had actually my abuser in it and I just asked them to turn it off. And so years ago, I would have been afraid to say something because I would have worried maybe they think I'm being a diva or being difficult. But I realized that I, I have to in order for me to be present here and in order for me to continue speaking up it's okay for me to say, I, I don't want to see the person who abused me face. And do you mind turning the, the video off? So I can't see it. Um, and so I've just learned, I have to, just like if I were to stick up for somebody else, I have to do the same thing for myself. I have to be my own advocate. And hopefully by me standing up for myself, it will encourage, if I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it will help encourage the survivor too, that if I say something that's triggering, I want you to tell me too, because we're all unique. We all have different things that trigger us. And the more we can understand it and communicate it, the better we can be there for one another. Because if someone's triggering me, I'm not going to be there. Like I'm going to be in a completely different place. I'm not going to be present. Um, and I think also just trying to take care of myself of, you know, realizing that on a day like today, when I'm feeling like I'm going to be talking about abuse in my own story a lot, you know, tonight I'm actually just going to take it easy and take some time for myself, hang out with my puppy who brings me a lot of joy, but making sure I'm not overdoing it and not talking about it all day or multiple days in a row so that I can just kind of like have some sort of balance is super important. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm still trying to figure it out and um, it's a work in progress, but finding people in my life that also help me laugh and not think about this is also really important too. Thank you, and congratulations on your beautiful question, Mariana. Yes, Angie Acosta from Red Más Noticias, Colombia. 
Hi, Ali. Nice to meet you. And thank you for sharing everything that you have talked here. And I am wondering, you talk a lot about how therapy is helping you to heal. And I was thinking about how uh, is the mental issues treated on Olympic US Committee and why, like as Simon Biles, you are asking to the Congress to do better things in related to mental health. So related to that, to that, I want to ask you like, if I if it was for you, what will you do in uh, related to mental issues for the Olympic people in and your companions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that mental health is so important. When I was training, I put more emphasis on You know, if I hurt my wrist, I would take time off, but I didn't understand until after I finished competing that I needed to put the same emphasis, maybe even more on my mental health. You know, if I was feeling really anxious or depressed, it, I needed to take time for myself and really like ask for help, just like I would go to the doctor if my wrist hurt. But that wasn't talked about when I was training. And I think that mental health is extremely important. I feel that it's important for the athletes that are training while they're competing is it's crucial, but it's also really important for when the athlete is done competing. What people don't realize is when we're done competing, we're, we don't, we're not taught how to navigate the next chapter of our life. When the athlete is done, sometimes, you know, you train your whole life for the Olympics and then you compete. Some of the athletes do really well. Some of them don't do as well as they wanted to, and they might be completely heartbroken. Um, and a lot of times athletes self-worth is wrapped up in their results. So there's no one helping us navigate how to realize we're more than just our sport and helping us realize what we can do in the next chapter of our life. And that is really hard and can be really um, dangerous because if an athlete feels that their worth is only wrapped up in their sport and they didn't perform as well, they might not have the confidence or they might be depressed and not be able to go on to finding something else that they really enjoy or realizing that they're worthy of finding something else. Um, and there's, we don't have like access from the United States Olympic Committee to um, good therapists or there's not, we didn't really have any resources that were able to help us if we were struggling with um, mental health. And so I think that putting that as a priority is important. And especially with how common abuse is within the United States Olympic Committee and how many um, victims and survivors there are. When you are a survivor of abuse, it definitely affects your mental health. So I think having that available to athletes as well, you know, a place where people can go where if you do confide in a therapist, there's no, um, there's no repercussions or retaliation. There's no one that the therapist isn't going to report to the United States Olympic Committee what you're saying. It's a safe place and everything you say will be kept private. And I think that that's not available right now. So I think that partnering with an organization that are the experts in the mental health field and getting people access to therapists, getting people access to communities and support systems. So these athletes, you know, they might feel better at first starting off with being in a support group with other athletes who are going through the same thing. I understand going to therapy can be intimidating. So having different places for athletes to go, if an athlete wants to do therapy, be in a support group, if they feel better, um, you know, journaling in a support group and not talking, there has to be different, different places for athletes to go to because mental health isn't one size fits all. And that's not what we have right now. Um, and that needs to be available for athletes for before they compete, during competition and after to help them with the next chapter of their life. Thank, Thank you, Ali. You. Next question, please, Mariana. Yeah, from Daniel Echeverri from Taze Sports Network. Estás en mute, Daniela. Hi, Ali, from Argentina. Nice to meet you. My question is in the same way as Anshis. Um, I uh, was hearing you talking about uh, the importance of uh, listening uh, to, your, to your body and to being kind, uh, the importance of being kind to yourself. And in, the, uh, in, a, in a sport, it's very difficult to be kind to yourself because gymnastics uh, is a sport uh, when, where girls 
uh, compete at senior level uh, at the age of 16, where the searching of for difficult exercise or difficult elements is like infinite. We, it's never, uh, never is enough. And it's like only uh, the ones, the chances are the ones that could survive to all of that period of, of very, very hard training. Uh, so the thing that uh, maybe the, the International Federation or, or the gymnastic community must uh, make a revision about some core uh, rules in gymnastics to contribute uh, in a, uh, for a healthier sport, uh, that for a healthy gymnastic, uh, gymnastics uh, that you are uh, like fighting or leading. Sorry, will you repeat that last part of the question? It cut out. Do you think that the uh, gymnastics community must uh, make a revision uh, about some rules uh, that, uh, that have, we have in gymnastics to contribute to a health environment for gymnasts and for a healthy sport? That's your, what your fight uh, here. Yeah, I, I believe that the United States Olympic Committee and USA Gymnastics have to do more to support their athletes. Um, and I believe that the most important place to start is to do a completely independent investigation and really get to the bottom of what happened and the scope of the investigation matters. It has to go back decades. Nobody's off limits. They need to get access to text messages, data, emails, everything and anything. And that will be the only way that there is trust within the sport because trust is really important. And it's crucial that the athletes, the families, you know, the guardians, whoever is in charge of these athletes that are in the sports, they deserve answers and they deserve to know that when they're dropping their kid off at gymnastics, that they can trust that the organization has their back. And if something happens, it will be handled with the utmost urgency, sensitivity, and it will be handled in the right way that has the best interest of the child, not the organization. And you know, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but the investigation is crucial in order for us to believe in a safer future, because without that, we're not going to have the answers and we don't want to go off of guesswork. And, and you know, we want to know that every single person who covered up our abuse is gone and that we need to also understand what policies are in place or were in place that allowed this monster to thrive for decades and what we can do to figure out to change those policies because without the investigation and changing policies and really having a clear understanding of everything, we can't believe in a safer future. Thank you. Next Thank you. question, Mariana, please. Yes, from Mexico, Reforma newspaper, Fernanda Palacios. Well, we continue with Eduardo Gutierrez from Quien Magazine, Mexico. Eduardo? Well, let's try uh, Fernando Cis from TNT Network, the TNT Sport Network. No escuchamos la pregunta. Fernando Cis from TNT Sport Network, are you there? Okay, we continue with Juan Ignacio Barbieri from Olé Newspaper Argentina. Hello. Hello, can you yes, hear me? Yes, we're listening. Yes, uh, hello, Ali. So nice to hear about you. My question is, have you received any messages from people of other countries, for example, South America, Europe, Asia? Ali, the after question the... is that if you have received uh, any kind of emails or correspondence from people from Latin America or South America asking for advice or for help. 
You know, I've been um, so blown away by the support that I've received over the years. And yes, I have received messages and, um, you know, we sometimes get emails or letters or I get um, direct messages on Instagram and I, I do get messages from people um, all over the world. And I am, it's a combination of um, heartbreaking to hear how many people can relate to my experience or how many people are struggling in some way. Uh, but it also, um, I feel a sense of community and I feel since I came forward and shared my story about abuse, I've felt more connected to um, people that I don't know um, more than I ever have before. And so I feel very grateful and I feel like I do have a community of people um, all over the world, even if I haven't met them personally, but maybe we've exchanged messages back and forth and we can relate to each other on some level. So I feel very grateful for that. Thank you, Ali. Next question, please. Yes, from Liza Zanetti from Splash Brazil. Uh, hi, Ali. Uh, thanks for having me. So uh, when you and other athletes testified before Senate on last September, uh, there were very specific demands and was a very powerful uh, testimonial. So what do you and other athletes are seeking now in terms of changes on how these investigations are handled, especially by the FBI and the DOJ? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we're, we're still... I, I really don't have an update um, of what's happening since the we testified. I have learned over the years that a lot of this stuff takes so much time and that is really also hard in my own healing journey as I've had to try to meditate a lot and, and take time um, because it is really frustrating and it's been, um, you know, I reported my abuse um, I believe over six years ago. And so it's been um, a long time. And some of the survivors even reported their abuse decades ago. And so the fact that we still don't have answers is unacceptable. And um, I do believe that there are senators who are really um, supporting us and are doing what they can to help us push this forward. Um, I haven't received um, any updates um, besides I believe the um, they were going to be looking into the the FBI again but I don't have any updates besides that um, I wish I did but I think for us it's you know without sounding like a broken record you know we just keep trying to push for the independent investigation and getting answers and once we have those answers um, you know relying on people in positions of power to do the right thing and um, if somebody feels that person should be held accountable, then that should be what happens and helping us figure out ways to change the policies and make sure it's a safer environment. Um, but I also think that the whole system really needs to be looked at and there needs to be a lot of, of changes. And, um, you know, hopefully for us, the survivors, we won't have to keep um, testifying and speaking out because I know it really takes a toll on all of us and we all just want to be able to see the organizations change. And we also want to be able to just um, heal. And every time we speak out, it definitely prevents that from happening and, and feels like I'm taking a lot of steps backwards. So it's, it's definitely a balance. And I still feel like I haven't fully covered from testifying. I think it hit me a lot in the last couple of weeks and I'm figuring out how to rest more and navigate that because it is, it's exhausting for lack of a better word. Thank you, Ali. Mariana, next Belen, question, please. Yes. Eleni Ligio from El Sol de Mexico, newspaper. Thank you. Hi, Ali. First of all, I, I want to tell you that you're very brave for speaking about all of this and supporting other victims. I would like to ask you about your relationship with the other gymnasts. How did it change? And are, are you still in touch with them? And how do you help them with these mental, mental health issues? Yeah, you know, I think that my teammates and I have been through some really incredible moments together. I think we've experienced some of the best moments of our lives together. And we've also experienced some of the hardest moments of our lives together. So I feel very connected to my teammates in a way that 
I don't always have that same relationship with my other friends that I didn't do gymnastics with. So I feel very connected to them. And they've certainly been people in my life that I call when I'm going through a hard time because I feel like they understand me and they get me, which really means a lot as a survivor to have that validation and to feel really seen and heard. And, you know, my relationship with my teammates is we we try to be as open and honest with each other. So there are some times when we chat on the phone and maybe one of us will say, um, I don't want to talk about this today and we don't talk about it. I will say though, we don't, when we're when we're chatting, most of the time we're not talking about the abuse. Um, of course, when we testified, that was very top of mind for us. So we would chat about it in case we wanted to be there for each other, in case somebody wanted to chat about something. But we don't chat about this most of the time when we talk. We talk about other things. We talk about, you know, other stuff going on in our lives, what we're excited about. You know, if I FaceTime them, I show them Milo, who's right here. Um, so I think it's life is all about balance. You have moments in friendships where you're laughing and having fun, and then you also be there for them when you need it. But I think recognizing like we don't talk about it most of the time because it's hard and, and I think we don't want to talk about it. But if we do want to talk about it, we're also there for each other as well. But of course, in the moments when we are testifying, for example, if that's like what's going on at that time, we are there for each other and we might talk about it a little bit more. Thank you so Thank much, you. Ali. Next question, please. Yes, from Infobae, Colombia, Nelson Daniel Guerrero. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Me escuchas? We love your dog, by the way. Thank you, me too. He's been, he's been um, so great for my mental health. Hola, I ¿me escuchas? a lot. For sure. <laughs> tu pregunta, por favor. Your question. Sí, eh, como, como persona cercana a, un, a una persona víctima, eh, encuentro fallas eh, en la educación que nosotros brindamos a nuestros niños para que estos no encuentren las, la confianza suficiente en revelar que han sido víctimas de algún abuso. ¿Qué otras fallas en los testimonios que tú has sabido encuentras en esta educación eh, para que la persona no sienta la confianza? Déjame traducirle. Ali, what he would like to know is that he realized that because he's very close to a survivor, that he not necessarily have all the proper tools to understand what's going on with them, what happened to them. So what do you think that besides the tool, what kind of information or what kind of education for prevention we can have for the kids to avoid these things to happen every day? That's a great question. I would encourage anyone who's interested to check out the Monique Burr Foundation because that is they have a program in place for schools and for kids to be educated on prevention and then I also encourage any adult who's interested to check out Darkness to Light and take the Darkness to Light course and um, for anyone who didn't hear before Darkness to Light and I provide the training for free and I really believe that it's a great place to start to have awareness and understanding of certain types of red flags or signs that somebody may be hurting a child and certain steps you can take to help them. I also think that having more conversations with people in your community and talking about the conversation about sexual abuse and encouraging others to do the same is really important. And, you know, if your child is going to um, gymnastics or soccer or school or summer camp, you know, start asking you know, the people in positions of power of what they're doing to have that dialogue with the children and um, what they're doing to educate and prevent. And if they're not doing anything, I think it's a great place to say that it's crucial that they do start doing something um, because I think we have to recognize as scary as it is, anywhere a child is, is where unfortunately a pedophile could be. And I think a lot of times people say, an abuser would never be here. It's a safe place. I watch the kids all the time. But we have to recognize that pedophiles work in places where children are. So I believe we can never be too safe. And educating and preventing is crucial. Thank you. And the last question from Brazil. Mariana? Yes, Edelie Fortunato from Journal 140. Hello, Ali. Thank you for your time. And 
you are amazingly brave to talk about this. Uh, you said you want to one day stop talking because it's dangerous to your mental health also. So I would like to see, to, to ask you, what are your plans for the future? Because you are a great speaker, you look great on camera. Maybe you want to do, I don't know, uh, documentaries or something about uh, dogs, because I see a lot of animals. Uh, what are your plans in the, in the future when you are not talking about this anymore? We hope we have this problem solved or better. What are you yeah, dreaming I... to do? Um, um, so, unfortunately, in my lifetime, I, I don't think that abuse will be solved. So I think I'll always be involved and always be very passionate about mental health and abuse prevention. And I always plan to continue to do the work as long as I can do it. Um, but I think that having more balance in my life is so important. So I'm excited to do projects that are very meaningful and hopefully continue to do maybe another show like the Darkness to Light show where I'm helping to um, continue this conversation and hopefully amplifying other survivors' voices and bringing on other experts and hearing their perspectives. I am really excited to continue to do more of that, but I also love being... Um, a dog mom. And so I think finding more balance in my life and finding just more ways to have fun. You know, when I was younger, I did gymnastics for from two years old and to 22 years old. And I took, I think, one year off um, after the 2012 Olympics, but I've pretty much done that my whole entire life. And so I'm excited in this next chapter of life to kind of just figure out who I am, what I like to do. I have recently be became very passionate about financial literacy and very passionate about encouraging the younger generation to learn more about how they can save money. And so that's a new passion of mine that I'm excited about learning more about. Um, and then also just having more fun. And um, I love gardening. I love being with friends and family. I love being outside. I'm learning how to cook. So I think my goal for the future is just figuring out who I am if I took away the survivor advocate gymnast, who would I be and um, figuring out what else I'm passionate about too. Cause I think life is really about balance and it's really important to have something you're passionate about and have something that's having a positive impact on the world, hopefully. And then also having days where we're just having fun and, and doing silly stuff too. Thank you so much, okay, Maria, for the you. questions, Ali. We want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being so amazing. What a wonderful human being. Such a generosity in every word, in every feeling that you're sharing with all of us. We are a better human beings after listening to you and sharing with you. Now we know a little more how to be there for others, how to become a better and bigger support group, how to be more in the prevention and education area to avoid these things to happen. And we don't want this to become the norm. We want to be this to become deception. And I think your example and your words are going to always remain with us in our hearts and in our minds. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your strengths, and raising your voice to say stop, and no more violence, no more abuse to anyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your time. I really appreciate it. And those your words are very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Till the next time. And you are not alone. We are with you and we're sharing the links for the organizations that you mentioned so everybody has more information and more tools. We that's what we need. Education and tools. Thank you so much. Take care. Mariana, por favor, eh, Juan Pablo, vamos a compartir el spot. Y estamos, gracias a todos por acompañarnos hoy día, gracias a Ali y gracias a todos los periodistas por su apoyo. Y estamos todos en esta lucha para eliminar la violencia y el abuso contra la mujer, contra los niños y contra todo el mundo. Lo más importante aquí es prevención, educación, información y estar ahí para poder apoyar a aquellas personas que necesitan nuestra ayuda y que son indefensos porque no tienen las herramientas, no tienen la educación necesaria. Así que no dejen de ver este documental maravilloso con Ali Reisman de la oscuridad a la luz este noviembre 25 solamente por Lifetime. Gracias a todos por el apoyo y buenas tardes. Thank you so much. Okay. 
So I am going on this journey and I'm going to be meeting with survivors. And as you know, the healing process is different for every single survivor. And it's something that is so important to me because it can be so frightening and scary to face it. And so I am meeting with survivors, hearing their stories and trying to help them heal. And so I was just wondering if you had any advice or anything that will help me better support survivors on this journey. The most important thing is for you to take care of yourself. You know, it's a, it is a, almost a ministry to be able to, and a, and a gift to be able to come into the lives of people and, and try to help them walk through this process or start it or continue it or whatever. Um, but it's so draining and it is so all-encompassing that you have to prioritize your well-being. You have to. You have to check in with yourself and know when it's too much. Han pasado casi seis años desde que denuncié mi abuso. Ganar medallas de oro no quita el dolor de lo que ocurrió. Voy a embarcarme en este viaje de sanación. Renuncié a mi voz durante mucho tiempo. Estaba tan conmocionada. Para mí la cura era una lucha. Solo quiero asegurarme de darles todo lo que necesitan. 